Hi everybody. So this talk will be on shiny data centric web application Python and this talk will be introducing shiny for Python and it's by Joe Joe Chang. A little bit intro about Joe. Joe is the CTO and first employee at Post It PBC, formerly known as R Studio, where he helped and help create create the R Studio ID and Shiny web framework along with countless complementary tools and packages. Please welcome Joe for his talk. Thanks, Vincent. Uh, today, I'm going to talk to you about Shiny for Python, a package for creating data-centric web applications in Python. This is an example of a pretty simple, typical Shiny app. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and click it and hopefully uh, show you the live version. Uh, on the left, we have some parameters that I can use to um, you know, affect the graph on the right. This is using Seaborn, and uh, on the back end, it's uh, Pandas or Polars or something, I don't remember. Um, and on the top here, I can show some uh, you know, big numbers. And uh, my colleague who created this example app wanted to make sure that I clicked on the penguins so I could see <laughs> the lovely art by uh, Allison Horst. So Shiny is, um, as I said, it's for creating interactive apps and dashboards in Python. And we'll, we'll get into some of the different applications today. But I want to emphasize, uh, because uh, how many here have heard of Shiny before? And uh, how many of you heard of Shiny in the context of R, not Python? OK. Um, I want to make sure that it's clear, because I've gotten this question. Shiny for Python is not a wrapper around Shiny for R. Um, this is not like you have to install R to use Shiny for Python. Shiny for Python is a ground up re-implementation of Shiny in pure Python. And it was designed primarily with data scientists in mind. And that means uh, it has a couple of implications. Number one, we don't expect you to have web development skills. Uh, you can do tons and tons of stuff in pure Python. And it's based on this reactive programming approach to interactivity that we specifically chose because it's easy to get started with and, uh, and, and relatively hard to make mistakes. On the other hand, I personally have been creating websites and web applications since 1996. Uh, it would be really frustrating for me personally if day in and day out I was working on this web framework that uh, felt lowest on the denominator in any way or that it had artificial guardrails. So if you do have web development skills, uh, you can fully leverage them to customize or extend your Shiny apps. And uh, it seems like even in data science, more and more people seem to be picking up some of these skills. And the same reactive programming paradigm that is uh, so easy to get started with, it's also powerful and flexible and deep, as I hope to show you today. Just to get concrete here, this is what a Shiny app looks like in Shiny for Python. Every, uh, this is like probably the simplest app, it's like a hello world app, basically. Every Shiny app has two main components. There is, uh, first, the user interface. And this is Python code that generates HTML to send to the browser. And in this case, it's going to look something like this. So we have, good. Um, so in this case, we have uh, an input slider and an output plot. And this app UI variable that it's creating is literally just HTML. Like if you were to print that at a Python prompt, that's what you would see. And the other component is this server logic that runs on the server at runtime, and it pro provides the interactivity of the app. In this case, if a user touches the slider and moves it to a new value, this input.n is automatically updated, and this entire function will run to generate a new plot that is sent to uh, whatever spot is designated in the UI by output underscore plot there. So that's the basics of, uh, of how a Shiny app is built. Um, at the bottom is just a single line to create an app object and assign it to an app variable. 
And this is what your um, user experience will be like as a developer. Uh, you're using VS Code here. We have a Shiny for Python VS Code extension, so you can um, just click this play button here if you have uh, a Shiny app on the screen, and it will run the Shiny app at the bottom, uh, it, putting you in the right virtual environment and things like that. And at the right, uh, the application will appear, and as you save changes to your application Python code, uh, it will go ahead and, and reload automatically, uh, as you expect in 2023 for a web framework. So um, let me show you a, a slightly more complicated example than just that uh, hello world. Uh, in this example, we are using the AstroPy astronomy package for Python to uh, create a tool that helps astronomers know when are the best times to look for these specific celestial objects that they're interested in observing. This will show you when they'll be brightest in the night sky, depending on what day and what location on Earth you're in. And uh, I'm going to show some code here. Don't, don't worry if you, um, you know, don't try to ingest it all. I just want to point out a couple things about this kind of code. Uh, so in this uh, shiny UI, we're using some additional features. First of all, uh, this is an H3 tag. In HTML, that means heading level three. So if you know HTML and you're familiar with HTML tags, you can directly access them by using these uh, Python functions that wrap the equivalent HTML tag. You can use Markdown. In this case, you know, we have a link in the middle that's using the Markdown syntax. And we can have rows and columns that have varying widths. We have outputs. We have inputs. And if you put all that together, uh, you have a UI that looks like this. And one other thing that I want to point out, when I zoom out, there's sort of a shape right, to the code. Because it's nested functions, there's sort of a shape that the indentation gives it. And there's like two big chunks here, one for the header and one for the body. And I really love this property that the shape of the code is reflected in the shape of the UI. And, and this, is, this is true uh, in sort of a hierarchical way. Uh, so inside of that body, there are two columns. And you can see that the shape of those columns reflected in the shape of the code. And as your apps get larger and more complicated, this is a really beautiful property because it means it's easy to find your way to you know, the specific spot in your complex UI uh, where, um, where you need to make changes. OK, so we announced Shiny for Python um, about a, uh, a little less than a year ago. And uh, you know, the news made the rounds. And on the R data science Reddit, uh, subreddit, uh, I think we had a pretty, pretty typical range of reactions. Uh, some people were really excited. <laughs> um, but other people said this. But it's just so easy to throw something up with Streamlit. Uh, how many people here have heard of Streamlit? OK, how many people have used Streamlit? OK, so, so a few of you. And Streamlit has this reputation for being just so easy. And I want to examine that, unpack that a little bit. So imagine that you have a script.py, a totally normal linear Python script that is doing some data analysis. Uh, let's say you're loading some data, you are maybe cleaning a, a little bit, um, and then you're previewing a pandas data frame and then plotting it. The promise of Streamlit is that you can take pretty much that exact uh, script, sprinkle in some streamlet to add some UI, and boom, you have now an interactive uh, you know, data product or what have you. Uh, and contrast that to Shiny, which if you've never seen Shiny before, even what I just showed you, clearly Shiny uh, wants you to put code in the places where it tells you to. So it is a different approach. And um, this, this approach that they have of being able to write shiny uh, streamlit apps in the same way you write Python scripts, uh, there's a very specific way to make this possible. Uh, Streamlit's architecture allows you to write apps the same way you write plain Python scripts. To unlock this, Streamlit apps have a unique data flow. Anytime something must be updated on the screen, Streamlit reruns your entire Python script from top to bottom. And let me be clear. Uh, it, is, it is easy. I mean, for simple Streamlit apps, 
uh, it is unbelievably easy. Um, you know, you, you could learn Streamlit by accident. You could <laughs> learn, you could write a Streamlit app falling down the stairs. I mean, it is really, really easy. Um, and they also have really nice looking output. I mean, it's pretty hard to make a bad looking Streamlit app. But this model also has limitations that, that are quite obvious. And um, especially with the early versions of Streamlit, you had this pretty slow performance because it's always executing the entire thing again and again. And pretty soon you need to uh, start being pretty deliberate about caching uh, values. And, uh, and you have pretty limited uh, opportunities for interactivity other than like changing parameters, the whole thing kind of re rebuilds. So Streamlit added some capabilities uh, called caching, callbacks, and session state. And uh, as people develop in their Streamlit journey, they find themselves relying more and more on these techniques. And uh, this is where I sort of, uh, I'm out, you know. <laughs> Uh, the combination of this beautifully elegant top to bottom execution model plus these other features, I think this combination is actually quite dangerous. And um, I'm not going to elaborate too much more on this. This is not a talk about Streamlit. But um, I just want to make it clear that this is not something that I made up. Um, I came to this conclusion by looking at the feedback that Streamlit's uh, most rabid fans were, uh, were giving them. So uh, in the big picture context, I see one critical issue for Streamlit. The top to bottom rerun on every interactive, uh, interaction paradigm. Uh, maintaining state becomes really difficult. And um, there are just multiple examples where people found this model at first super simple, and then ultimately um, kind of painted them into a corner. So what we've tried to do with Shiny and this reactive approach um, is to have a paradigm that's both easy to get started with and it scales. It scales as the complexity of your apps scale. It scales as um, the kinds of things you want to do to extend your apps increase. And over the last 10 years, um, as Shiny for R has proliferated on these same ideas of reactivity, we've seen people build uh, rather complex data apps indeed. And a lot of the time, if you, you know, talk to our, our, uh, our users and customers who are getting the most value of, out of Shiny, they're often um, building rather complex, not just a simple dashboard, not just a simple uh, you know, model demonstrator, um, but really using Shiny for those things, yes, but also integrating into you know, critical uh, workflows. And this idea of reactivity that was really the kernel that started Shiny, over the last 10 years, it's been unbelievable to me how fertile this ground is for new ideas. That these small reactive primitives that um, we've been working with since 2012 really can be combined in all these interesting ways. And you know, features like this just sort of fall out left and right. And even after 10 years, uh, last week getting ready for this talk, um, my colleague Winston Chang and I discovered a new way to use reactivity to interact with uh, async Python generators uh, in a way that made, uh, you'll see, one of our demo applications possible. Okay. Uh, so now I'd like to launch into some demos, and it's 2023. What is uh, Tech Talk without some kind of large language model demo? Right? Um, so this is a package that um, Winston has been working on that basically uh, makes it easier for him to scratch his own itch of playing with uh, OpenAI's ChatGPT API. So this is a super simple Shiny app that you can see here. We're importing this chat module that's new. And uh, with one line of UI and one line of server, and this is where I hope uh, the API works well today. Oops. No. Stop it. <laughs> OK. Uh, with one line of UI, one line of server, I have a chat GPT interface. So at like, why is the sky blue? Uh, and the fact that this text is streaming in, this is, this is that thing that we were playing with with async generators. 
Um, uh, you know, it's ChatGPT, so why is the sky blue as a wrap? <laughs> uh, so really easy, but um, uh, this is not that interesting if we're just inserting an island of ChatGPT into a shiny app, right? What we really want to do is be able to interact with uh, and, and, and mess with the conversation between uh, ChatGPT and the user. Uh, so, for this next example, um, so uh, Winston again, uh, picking on Winston, I guess this demo uh, session. Winston recently bought a Samsung uh, induction range. He really wanted me to tell you guys he bought a fancy new shiny uh, induction range. And um, this range is pretty new, and ChatGPT uh, GPT 3.5 is only current up to September 2021, something like that. So um, despite having uh, a PhD, uh, he was not able to figure out how to set the time on the clock of his new stove. Uh, so what this application lets you do is uh, take a PDF, so in this case the Samsung induction range, uh, the user manual. And, uh, and you upload it to this document. And now uh, it's indexing, it's, it's generating embeddings. And when I ask a question, it's going to send the context to ChatGPT. So I can say, uh, how do I set the clock, uh, set the time on the clock? Give me a list of steps. Okay, great, and now our, um, our clock can stop flashing 12. Um, so uh, in, this, in this example, um, you know, we had to uh, change the, uh, the payload that's being sent to uh, ChatGPT uh, without having that interfere with the user experience. So that's one thing that this, uh, that this package lets you do. Uh, and then one more, ChatGPT example, and then I'll move on. <laughs> so this one's a little different in that there are two ChatGPTs that I've embedded in this one app. And uh, it's, it's really fun to, to uh, you know, sort of compare as you um, have one conversation, you can talk to like another model and ask it different things. But um, let's play 20 questions. I'll ask, or I'll guess. Okay. And uh, this app has this mode where you can uh, have these two uh, models talk to each other. So let's play 20 questions. You guess first, or go ahead and guess. And I can click this converse with self, and every time a response comes back from one of these uh, conversations, it'll be directed to the other side. So now we are watching uh, ChatGPT play 20 questions with itself. Uh, is it an object? Yes, it's an object. Is it commonly found? Yes. Is this sort of, there's a lot of yeses. This is a little bit suspicious. <laughs> I should have turned the temperature up, I guess. Um, can it be used for cooking food? Yes, can it be used for cooking food? Is it made out of metal? Uh, this is some BS. What is with all? <laughs> Honestly, this doesn't usually happen. This seems very rigged. <laughs> is it a frying pan? Oh, this is so... Come on. Okay. Uh, so that doesn't usually happen, uh, but uh, this does usually happen. Uh, if you... <laughs> <laughs> I actually don't have anything else planned. It's going to be 20 minutes for this. Uh, um, yeah, you never know. You never know what's going to come out. Yesterday when I tried this, it was just smiley emoji. And that was, it was that recursively forever. So. All right. 
probably cost me like $2. <laughs> okay. um, so this package is available um, at this QR code. Uh, it's super, super wet cement. I mean, like, I think this has existed for like a total of four business days now. So uh, definitely, uh, you know, API yeah, can change and things like that. But it's super fun to play around with. Um, okay. So for my uh, next demo, uh, this is using um, a demo that, an example that came from Plotly. So this is a Plotly uh, widget on the right here showing a, a 3D uh, visualization of Brownian motion. Now Brownian motion is like the random motion of a particle on a surface or in a, in a, in a volume of air or something like that. And I can hit new data here to uh, generate new samples, uh, new random samples. And some of these look really cool, and some of them, like this one, it's a little harder to see what's going on, just because of the random angle that the, that the camera happens to be at. Now, because this is uh, plotly, they have this feature where you can click and drag, and that's cool, right? Um, but just for fun, for this example, uh, we're gonna do something different. So I'm using the uh, Google Media Pipe uh, library to uh, track the position of my hand. So, um, so Google's doing all the heavy lifting, like detecting the, the land uh, marks on my hand. Uh, but Shiny is calculating a normal vector shooting out of my palm and then using that uh, to determine where the, where the camera angle goes. And the reason I show you this, besides you know, just that's kind of fun, um, is this feature here, the smooth tracking. So if I turn this off, this is what this demo originally looked like. And uh, you know, when I got this working, I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. And my, my, uh, my son is a senior in high school and uh, is gonna be a computer science major next year. I was like, come over and come look at this. And he was like, why is it so jittery? <laughs> Ungrateful. Um, so, <laughs> uh, so yeah, but, but you know, uh, I, it's a good question. Like, why is it so jittery? And it's jittery because sensors are jittery, right? Um, but uh, I thought it was an interesting question. Can we make it not so jittery? So we tried a couple things. We tried um, only registering movement if it was over a certain number of pixels, and that was like a complete mess. It was super stuttery and slow. Uh, and then we thought, like, what if we just uh, average over the last five samples that we collect. And that's, that's the approach here. It's just a simple mean over the last five samples. And, um, and it works great, it's super smooth. And what's interesting about this, um, oops. What's interesting about this is, um, number one, it took about 10 minutes to implement that smoothing in 30-something uh, lines of code. But what this is, is actually not a smoother for this app. This is a generalized smoother for any reactive value or source in Shiny. So that means that any kind of input that you have in Shiny that's, that's fast and noisy, you can apply this function, tell it how many samples you want to smooth over, and provide your own algorithm for how you take n samples and collapse them into one. Uh, in my case, I was doing a mean, but you can do whatever you want. Um, with, with this short snippet of code, we have generalized smoothing available in, uh, in any Shiny app you care to use. And uh, that's kind of what I was talking about. You know, we keep discovering uh, these new applications of this technology called uh, reactive programming. Okay, just a couple more features I want to talk about. Uh, one is uh, Shiny Live. Shiny Live is the combination of Shiny and the power of WebAssembly uh, via the, the uh, pretty famous at this point Pyodide project. So if you haven't heard of it, Pyodide is Python running inside of your web browser using WebAssembly. And uh, what this lets you do is have an experience like this, where we have this web page loaded, and there's actually nothing behind this web page other than HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Uh, there is no server running in Python. Python is running entirely within the browser. And uh, this is just showing a, uh, a CPU, a real-time CPU graph. Well, to be fair, 
One thing you cannot do in the browser is monitor the host computer's CPUs. So this is fake data. Um, but if you imagine some other streaming uh, you know, data source, the same uh, kind of techniques would apply. Uh, we have a, a pandas style uh, data table at the bottom. And, um, and we can change this, um, this color palette uh, to, to have different color maps. Um, and this one is not awesome. Uh, so let's go ahead and remove that as an option. Uh, so we can come here and delete this. And if I press play, now it is reloaded and, uh, and my update has taken effect. So um, pretty nice to be able to just come to this web page. Anyone could, you don't have to install Shiny on your local anything. You can just start playing with Shiny through the shinylive.io website. And if you like what you've done here, you can even share it uh, through a URL. So you can, um, if you want to send this to a friend that you want to see the code, then uh, you can use this link and they have basically the same editing uh, experience as you did. Or you can click here and say like, no, I want this just to feel like a full on application. And, uh, and it hides all the Chrome and just shows the app. So um, the nice thing about this is that um, the computation now is all happening on the browser. So uh, you can actually use this technology to deploy Shiny apps to any static web host. So you can put it on GitHub pages or, or what have you instead of having to uh, pay for uh, you know, Heroku. Uh, we also have um, free, free hosting, but if you wanted to put it on any static web host, you could. Um, and you can also easily embed these kinds of Shiny applications in uh, Quarto. If you haven't heard of Quarto, um, it is a way of stitching together uh, narrative through uh, markdown uh, and computations and outputs of computations all together in beautiful documents. Um, my colleague JJ Allaire will be talking about that later this uh, afternoon. And um, what this lets you do is it lets you combine these uh, applications either bare like this or with a full editing experience directly into uh, your, your uh, documents and reports. Super easy to do. Uh, and we like that feature so much that we actually use Quarto to build our documentation website. So when you're learning Shiny, um, all of our examples uh, take place in these little editors and all of this is, uh, is using Quarto and Shiny Live. Uh, one more feature, we, th this, is not, this is not available yet. Um, this is something that we're working on, but I was really excited about it, so I wanted to at least give you a preview. Um, we have a Shiny UI editor that's being developed that is a way to drag and drop your way to uh, creating Shiny UI. So instead of writing the, the UI code that I showed you with nested function calls, uh, you can use controls on the left, drag them onto this surface in the middle, and then use the uh, pane on the right to modify properties. And um, all this is doing is just writing the same code you would write. Uh, so um, the end result is not a lot different than if you, if you were to write it by hand. So you, know, you can change some properties on the slider here. What you're seeing in the middle is just sort of a wireframe version of the application. It's not high fidelity, but in the lower right, it's rendering a preview that is showing the live application. And you can click it to see what your application actually looks like. So uh, still early days for this thing, but uh, we expect to be uh, rolling it out in the coming months, and we're super excited about um, making it easier for people to create, especially if, you have, uh, if you're building dashboards that have a bunch of rectangles on it to get the spacing exactly right and to get the right proportions. Uh, it's one of those things that's uh, easier when you're dragging and looking at it in real time than, um, than writing the code. Okay, that is it for me. Um, if you uh, are interested in writing powerful reactive web applications, I highly encourage you. Go to shiny.plus.co slash pi. Uh, we have examples and uh, lots of articles and uh, reference documentation there. Um, that QR code is to the main website. And if you're interested in uh, the source code of my examples, minus the uh, chat ones, um, they're at Pi Data Seattle 2023. Um, and maybe uh, in the middle of questions, I'll switch over to, to show the other slide again. So, uh, yeah, thank you.
Uh, so I, I tend to leave plenty of time for questions. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, in the back. Hi. Um, I've never used Shiny, but I was just wondering if you could characterize how, if I have like some data on the back end that I want to reference or plug into this, suppose I have a file that has, I don't know, a couple hundred thousand rows of data, what should I think about, or do you have a capacity limit? Or... Yeah, sure. Uh, I think the question was uh, if you have data on the back end that's maybe a couple hundred thousand rows, or, or really, I think the question you're asking is like, how do you get your data into this thing, and yeah. what yeah, size yeah. Yeah. limitations do you need to worry about? Um, so you can use any sort of um, Python code you want to load your data, um, and uh, you know our example apps use uh, pandas and polars and DuckDB and. Um, Pretty much, it's up to you how you want to load your data. Um, now, there are a couple things that are worth talking about as far as um, you know scalability and things like that go. Uh, number one, uh, as a general rule, your data stays on the server. So if you're looking at a bunch of plots you made in Seaborn, um, and uh, and that's it, then you know you could load you know gigs of data and none of it is transferred over the wire, just the actual outputs that the user is viewing. Um, and that may sound obvious, but that's not true for all uh, Python uh, data science frameworks. Um, now, there are, uh, I think that the main thing that you'll have to worry about is, uh, number one is memory consumption. Uh, so um, in order to get good performance, you um, want to not be going back to like reading a huge CSV every time the user kind of touches anything. So uh, by default, um, Shiny has these reactivity features actually on the screen here, so it's reactive calc. Um, this is sort of a way to do very smart caching of, uh, of your, your data as it changes. So in general, it'll cache the last copy, like the current copy uh, of your data that you're displaying. So if you're loading a gigantic uh, data frame and that is the result of your uh, reactive calc expression, Shiny is going to hold one copy of that in memory. Uh, if you do a bunch of aggregation on it before you return it, then Shiny will just hold the aggregated values, which could be, you know, um, much much smaller. So, uh, and also I think as your data gets bigger, then just like anything in, in uh, you know Python data analysis, you start to look at sort of out of memory things. You start to look at uh, things like DuckDB or using you know a full blown database or a lab system or something like that, uh, and maybe not just loading CSVs into memory. Yeah. I'm curious, uh, how easy was it to move Shiny over to Python? Like, Python has kind of a very, has been used for web development for a long time compared to R. I'm just kind of curious if you have any feelings on that. Yeah, how hard was it to move Shiny over to Python? Um, I think it was one of those things that seemed really scary until we started, uh, and then it went very quickly. Um, and uh, that includes um, having to uh, really learn like Python's type annotation system wasn't something that existed the last time I really did any real Python. Uh, and that was something our whole team you know, had to pick up and get good at. Um, but you know, I'd say like 90% of it was uh, like surprisingly fast. And then every once in a while there was something that like creating the reference documentation to an ungodly amount of time. Like, so there were like surprising things that ended up taking the other 90% of the time. Yeah? What would be the difference between using something like Shiny to what we've done? Yeah. We're deciding what to choose for the team, so that's what we're going to do. Yeah, uh, I was expecting that. It took three minutes to get to that question. <laughs> uh, no, 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 it's, it's, it's a really good question, and I, and I almost um, addressed it in my talk, and then just thought I'd leave it for a question. Um, well, every web framework um, has its own opinions about what's important, and we all make different trade-offs. And um, in the particular case of Dash, the, the most opinionated thing they did uh, was they made the server stateless. And um, that means that uh, there is no memory uh, in, in Dash between one invocation of a callback and another. So um, it's kind of like, to me, that has always puzzled me as the choice that they made because um, it, it has such 
it introduces uh, such annoying limitations for the app author, and really mostly has a marginal benefit for the people who ultimately have to deploy the app. Um, I actually was curious about this. I was going to make this assertion that it, you know, has this like big downside and like fairly marginal uh, upside. And um, I think we have a lot of customers that um, use Shiny for R and Dash for Python. And I don't think anyone has ever said, oh, and like we love that Dash is serverless. Like it just, uh, I mean, stateless. Like it turns out that it just doesn't matter for the vast majority of, of uh, especially data-oriented uh, applications. Um, but listen, I'm here to learn. So if you are a Dash user and you love Dash and I'm wrong and you know you love the stateless aspect of it, um, then absolutely please come talk to me at the, uh, at the positive booth. Um, but I, I will say, um, I think when people start to realize um, how much state is being transferred to the server every single time you, you know, touch anything, like if you upload a CSV, you're really just holding it in the client. And every single output that renders, every single time they render, you have to send that data to the server in every XHR call. And that, uh, that's just like a really surprising trade-off to me. Um, so uh, in fairness, Dash uh, Plotly has a page about, like they know this is a problem, so they have a page of like, here are all these mitigations. But to me, like that exact problem that they have workarounds for was the heart of Shiny. Like the heart of Shiny is that you have this state that you're going to want to use again and again as you tweak through you know, the different possibilities of your analysis. And uh, what we treat it as core, they treat it as sort of um, you know, a little more of an afterthought. So. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, so the question was um, at at your work, did they uh, embed bokeh or really integrate bokeh applications into uh, larger applications that are written in Flask. Uh, so almost. Uh, Shiny is not based on Flask, but based on uh, the newer ASGI frameworks. So uh, it is based on Starlet or Fast API. If you've heard of that. So you can combine Shiny with Fast API applications in exactly the same way that you can combine Bokeh with, um, with Flask. Uh, that being said, for existing Flask uh, applications, the other way you could go, which people do with Shiny for R, is um, to aggregate at the proxy layer. Uh, so you would run an Nginx server in front of both servers and then use that to basically like map Shiny onto a certain your shiny app onto a certain URL path. Uh, I'm making it sound more complicated than it is. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, there's yeah over here in front. So if you are uh, an iron state server, how do you handle multiple people accessing the shiny app at the same time? Yeah. So the question was, um, if we're a stateful server, how do we handle multiple people accessing the server at the same time? Uh, and that is an excellent question. Um, there are a couple ways we do that. So let me first talk about multiple people hitting the same server, right? Um, or the same Python process. So this server function uh, is actually invoked <coughs> once per visitor, or once per, uh, we call it a session, but it's like a browser tab, basically. Uh, so uh, each um, each visitor that arrives gets their own uh, copy of this input-output in a session. So everything that you do inside of the server function is isolated to that one user. Uh, but a really interesting uh, consequence of this architecture that I, that I really love is that you can put things here. Uh, so you can put like reactive objects here, and then they're actually shared by all users. So you, you can decide what things are global, what things are specific to each user. Um, now, the other question you might be wondering is, if you have multiple servers in a cluster, uh, how do you, you know, there's, there's, there's something in memory uh, on a particular server, how do you make sure that it's routed? Um, so for that, we just ask that you turn on sticky load balancing, which every load balancer has that feature uh, and pretty much problem solved. Uh, yeah, in the back there. 
I have some questions. So, like, when you share shiny apps and stuff like that, what is there any obfuscation to like underlying data that like comes through? Like, so if you're sharing an app outside of your organization or yeah. your conference or anything like that, do you like is it easy to like I guess inspect and like get just all the underlying data, or is there like some that's secure? Oh man, like. Can you imagine if I answered like, yes, it's easy to get at the underlying data? <laughs> that would be real bad. Uh, no, so, so for Shiny, um, it is, uh, at the end of the day, it's a web application. So um, the messages that are going back and forth over the wire are the inputs and the outputs. The underlying data, the underlying um, code uh, remains locked away on the server. Um, the one exception to that is the Shiny Live mode where everything's running on the client. Well, in that case, everything's being shipped to the client. So if you have hard-coded a password into your Shiny application and then ship it via Shiny Live to the browser, well, yeah, you made a mistake. Uh, but if you host it any of the traditional ways where Python is running on the server uh, and the front end is just you know, showing pictures and, and giving you inputs, then uh, everything is perfectly safe. Just like the same way it would be in Flask, the same way it would be in Django or, or any other web application framework. Yeah. Uh, so you, you're comparing it to Flask and Django fast API. Is the CI CD like like this looks like really from a developer piece of uh, actual perspective super easy to get up and running? Um, the, then the, the logical next question is okay now I need people at my organization to use this. I need it to get deployed. I need to make get rid of updates, um, to make improvements. Is that kind of standard, or are there any additional considerations beyond like the typical fast API development deployment? Yeah. Yeah, you sound like someone who works for a living. That, uh, that's a very uh, practical uh, and important question. So uh, the question was, yeah, this seems great for whoever's writing the application, but when it comes to the time to deploy it and uh, integrate it into CI/CD uh, uh, pipelines and, and keep it up and keep it stable, is there anything that you need to be aware of? Uh, so in terms of the deployment, it feels pretty much like a typical uh, fast API uh, type app. Uh, however, um, uh, I'd say if you write a traditional Django or Fast API type app, uh, the testing can be easier because really what you're write, writing uh, for most of those sort of lower level web frameworks is a series of endpoints. Uh, and with uh, Shiny, all this interactivity, this is happening over a WebSocket. There's no reason why that's not inherently testable, but like most people in most organizations do not have a lot of experience testing WebSocket based applications. So I will say, uh, we have been using Playwright. If you use Playwright or Cypress as testing frameworks, they work awesome. Uh, and Playwright will even let you inspect the web, tra uh, web socket traffic as it goes through. But yes, if you have people that are used to testing Django apps, uh, specifically the testing aspect and also the load testing aspect, it's probably going to throw them for a loop for a little bit. Uh, but other than that, uh, I, I mean, and to be honest, the turnaround times on building these kinds of apps for people who know a little bit of Shiny, like it is so dramatically different than what it is for using, uh, I mean, and by the way, the same is true for Streamlit and Dash. You were talking about uh, a different order of magnitude uh, velocity versus um, using sort of these lower level frameworks that, um, you know, people get that there are going to be these kinds of trade-offs where, you know, the, the wires are not quite as visible and you can't instrument them quite as well. Uh, yeah, uh, one final question, or no, you guys are out. That's fine. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.